Our next scripture reading is from the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. I'll be reading from the NRSV version. Okay. But the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish they seemed to have died, and their departure was thought to be a disaster and they're going from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace. For though in the sight of others they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Like gold in the furnace, he tried them, and like a sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted them. In the time of their visitation, they will shine forth, and they will run like sparks through the stubble. They will govern nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord will reign over them forever. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are upon his holy ones, and he watches over his elect. Again, thank you, Lord, for your word. Amen. Because we don't have a special service on All Saints Day like some churches do, we celebrate uh, All Saints Sunday, Uh, except, of course, when All Saints Day falls on a Sunday like it did last year. So welcome to All Saints Sunday 2021. Uh, The scripture that I chose for this morning's second reading that Mary just read is only found in Catholic and Christian Orthodox Bibles. It's part of a collection of books written between the Old Testament and the New Testament that is commonly referred to as the Apocrypha. And what happened is these early churches... uh, early church councils, I guess I should say, who determined what books were to include in the Bible, had some serious questions about their authenticity, which is why uh, they are not in our canon. Sadly, uh, the word apocrypha has become synonymous with falsehood, or fabricated, or lie. And so whenever a preacher from a Protestant tradition wants to read them in church, there's the risk of being called a heretic. Okay? I don't hear it. This is good. Because really, honestly, two of my study Bibles contain these books, which, which in my study Bible are, are labeled deuterocanonical. Canonical. Canon- canonical. Which is a mouthful, but it sounds a heck of a lot better than apocrypha, right? So... And I'm not kidding you when I say that I have to be careful about where I lay those things down and in what context, because if a curious person comes around and starts flipping through it and they see all these extra books in there, it won't be long before people are praying for my souls. So (laughs) the problem is I really enjoy these books that are deuterocanonical. Canonical. I can't say that right. Um, Two of my favorite prophet of Daniel stories are in these books. And uh, the uh, Wisdom of Solomon, which Mary read, is a really great book uh, with all sorts of discussion starters about all sorts of interesting subjects, including the afterlife, which is what I want to address this morning, because it's All Saints Sunday. So, A couple of weeks ago, I said a great way to start a lively discussion in the church is to bring up the subject of how God does or does not answer prayer. You want to know another one? Here's another fun discussion starter for you. Bring up the afterlife. Have a little chat about what happens to a person when they die. And, you know, some people will argue that even though the Bible says very little about the afterlife, some Christian traditions will will put all their eggs in the afterlife basket. 
Uh, and the criticism here is that the people who put so much emphasis on securing their place in the afterlife often pay very little attention on how to follow Jesus in the here and now. So, on the other end of that spectrum are those who completely dismiss the afterlife. The criticism there is, well, maybe that's fine for you, but there's a lot of people uh, who are less privileged in this world uh, who's, uh, who um, have catastrophically tragic lives and whose only hope is the promise of a heavenly reward. And then it goes back and forth. Well, yeah, well, you use heaven and hell as a carrot and a stick to coerce people into faith. And then somebody else will say, oh, yeah, well, you make it seem like life is so hopeless and that you can get away with anything because nothing really matters. And the live little dis lively little discussion goes on and on and on and back and forth until somebody's feelings get hurt and the word heretic comes up again. <laughs> so here's the reality. The reality is that the Old Testament, which, remember, makes up the majority of our Bible, says, really, says very little about uh, a conscious afterlife. It wasn't until much later in the Old Testament scriptures that you start seeing uh, attempts to flesh out a theology of the afterlife, in, in, and that's only in some of the later prophetic books. You know, things like, what happens when you die? Uh, is it nothingness? Is there heaven and hell? Is there judgment? Is there eternal rest? Because inquiring minds want to know. This is why I turned to the wisdom of Solomon this morning, because even though it's not in everybody's Bible, this book has some pretty profound things to say about the afterlife. So, one of the reasons most Bibles don't include the Wisdom of Solomon has to do with its authorship and how late it was written. It is not a book of wisdom like Proverbs or Ecclesiastes. It is a book about uh, wisdom and uh, the pursuit of saving knowledge. It was clearly not written by Solomon, but it was. Uh, most scholars think that it was written by uh, a Jewish person with some knowledge of Greek philosophy and rhetoric. And even though the book says that it is addressed to the um, rulers of the earth, it was probably most likely uh, kind of a teaching guide, maybe a textbook written for young Jews in the first or second century, who, and that's B.C., who were slipping away from the Jewish heritage into this Greco-Roman materialism that was so prevalent in the day. But what I want to focus on is that first nine verses in chapter 3, which in my Bibles is uh, called the destiny of the righteous, which seems like a good passage to be talking about on All Saints Sunday. It starts out by saying, the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died and their departure was thought to be a disaster and they're going from us to be their destruction, but they are at peace. Shoot, I'd use that as, a, as an opening sentence in a graveside service. In fact, I have. <laughs> um, the lesson here is that the righteous belong to God, whether in life or in death. Okay? And what's nice is that, for the most part, it addresses the concerns of both, both spectrums of that afterlife argument. Okay? Um, it does not present a carrot and a stick to coerce people into believing any kind of specific doctrine. And there is acknowledgement that those who are tormented in this life have hope for immortality and peace. In this life, it says, there are tormentors, which are the ungodly, and the tormented, which is the godly. In the next life, the tormentors will be punished, while the tormented will prosper and have peace in the next life. Pretty straightforward. Mind you, I could treat you all to a big analysis of eschatology and thanatology and how the Christian understanding of life after death is a merger between the Hebrew and Greek uh, understandings of it, but I don't want to put you all to sleep because we are just now getting used to the time change, right? 
So I'm going to just say that I affirm the afterlife. That's a long way to say that, Jesse. Okay, fine. But I'm not going to use this affirmation that I have for the afterlife to angle you all over the, 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 the flames of hell uh, to try to coerce you so that we have more money in the offering plate or whatever. But nor will I dismiss anybody's tragic circumstances to suggest that their suffering will go unrecognized by the one who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, the one who created us in God's image, sustains us, and walks through life with us. So, now that we've placed death on the table um, and resurrection as well, let's take a look at that first scripture that Mary read, and that was from John 11. And that is the story of Jesus raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. This passage contains the shortest verse in the Bible, right? John 11.35. Jesus wept. That's so nice. Even, and that's the King James Version too, so good job. Even my sweet, kind Eldora Flick, my childhood vacation Bible school teacher, would not give us a Rice Krispie treat for two words. <laughs> but see, the NRSV, which Mary read from, at least has a more accurate rendering of the original language, and that is Jesus began to weep, but still no prize. So here's something that bothers folks about this whole story. By the time we get to verse 35, the author makes it clear that Jesus already knew Lazarus died and that he was going to go and raise him from the dead. Uh, the lectionary is, is kind of weird. The lectionary kind of chops this story in half. But right before we pick up this story in verse 32, Jesus told his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. So if Jesus knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, what was all the crying and weeping about? See, there, there's no uh, Lazarus-shaped hole that Jesus is going to have to live with in his heart for the rest of his life like when we le lose a loved one, right? Jesus knows Lazarus will be up and about after he sees him. So why are there any tears at all? Well, the simplest and probably most common answer to that question is probably at least partly true, and that is that Jesus is grieving over the continued intrusion of death in God's creation. See, even though Lazarus' death will be reversed, at least for a time, Jesus still grieves the existence and continued impact of death. See, he feels the pain that it causes people and, and is angry at its continued capacity to, to tear people apart and devastate all that it visits. See, I, I like this notion because there are plenty of other places in the scriptures that describe Jesus' compassionate identification with our pain. But there's something else, too. Something that I think in this situation was unique to Jesus. Um, a grief that I think was his alone. Another thing that we don't get to see with this reading is that uh, the corrupted chief priests and some Pharisees later on held this council meeting and decided that they were going to arrange to have Jesus killed. And according to John's gospel, this was a direct response to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And bringing uh, Lazarus back to life was the trigger that set off the chain of events that led to Jesus being killed. And according to John's gospel, Jesus knew it would. He knew what this was going to cost him. So uh, has anybody ever read C.S. Lewis's The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe at all? Okay, a few of us did. Uh, if you'll remember that after the lion, Aslan, has committed himself to die in the place of Edmund, he becomes sad and depressed. He, he quits eating. 
he withdraws. He gets all moody. And I'm thinking, well, wouldn't, wouldn't you? I mean, just because you've accepted your death doesn't mean you welcome it, right? John is telling the same story here. Aslan was saving Edmund's life. Uh, he was saving Edmund from death, but only by resigning himself to meeting death in his place. Jesus is saving Lazarus from death, but only by resigning himself to meeting his death. And in this little story, we are seeing just a snapshot of a much bigger story. Jesus is saving us all from death by meeting death on our behalf. And so, Jesus wept. As we might under the same circumstances too, right? So if you came to our Bible study on the John tradition a few years ago, you'd recognize this and say, oh, this is so John, right? Jesus takes on death in order to save us from death. How powerful a message is that? And yet, despite all these tears being shed, there is a promise of a day when tears will be wiped away and mourning and crying and pain will be no more. And on that day, we will be reunited with our loved ones and with the whole communion of saints who have gone on before us because how could every tear be wiped away and every grief banished if we were not? What's the phrase uh, from that old hymn, what a day of rejoicing that will be? But between here and there, between now and then, there will be uh, tears right? The good news, though, is that in Christ, our griefs are gathered into his grief, and thus our griefs participate in his grieving. Think about that. See, in a little bit, Mary's going to lead us through a time of recognition for the people who died this past year who form what the church calls um, the cloud, the great cloud of witnesses. And then immediately after that, we gather at the Lord's table, uh, still surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses who've gone on before us. Neither of those things will fill those holes that these various people have left, but here at the table, even our grieving, even our mix of fondness and sadness that our remembering may bring is all gathered up into the hope that we may one day be reunited again. As Mary often reminds all of us, grief is okay. There's nothing wrong with grief. It's normal. There is no shame in it. It is okay to grieve in protest against the living, the the, uh, lingering presence of death in this world but offer your grief to God with the hope that all may be one again and that every tear may be wiped from our eyes and death will be no more and that mourning and crying and pain will be no more because the old order has passed to make way for the new.